you don't know me, I'm Angie Zolo. I'm the Vice President for UConn Students for Life. Hi, everyone. Um, and I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Um, Christina Bennett is currently the Communications Director for Family Institute of Connecticut. Um, she was the former Client Services Manager for a Pro-Life Pregnancy Center, has written for Live Action News and Found for Life. And in 2016, she received the Defender of Life Award for Students for Life of America. Um, so without any further ado, I'll introduce Christina Bennett, and she's going to talk about how abortion is both a civil rights and a human rights issue. A, a woman's right and a woman's choice. What we don't talk about is the fact that one woman usually has a circle of people surrounding her, and it's all of their voices. So for pregnant girls on campus, it's not just her choice because she feels like her teacher's telling her, if you keep this baby, you know, how are you going to be able to, to have this class load? And she feels like her boyfriend's saying this, or her job, a lot of pregnancy discrimination. And so there's a lot of voices, and my mom had that too, a lot of voices around her. So she went to the hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, and she met with the counselor. But she didn't get any counsel. I looked at her and was like, well, this seems like the best decision for you to make. Why was that? Who knows? Was it because she was young? Was it because she wasn't married? Was it because she was black? Was it because she was low income? I would assume all of the above, but for whatever reason, you know, she decided this is the best decision for you to make. She told her, go into the doctor's office and uh, just, you know, just wait. Wait for him. Go into the waiting room and wait for him to call your name. So my mother paused in between the counselor's office and the waiting room, and she just began to cry, just kind of quietly to herself. She definitely is not the type to make a scene, so she wasn't making a scene. And there was an African-American woman, a janitor, at the other end of the hallway, and she saw my mom crying, she walked up to her, she lifted up her chin and asked her, you know, what's going on? Do you, do you want to have your baby? And my mom said yes. And if you think about that, um, that's a very simple question. Do you want to have your baby? I mean, counseling 101, right? <laughs> the counselor should have asked her that question, but she didn't ask her that question. It was the janitor who asked her that question, do you want to have this baby? And my mom said yes. Also a simple answer, but a hard one for her to get to. It took a lot for her to get to that yes. It was in that moment that she said yes. And the woman said, you know, God's going to give you the strength, which is what my mom you know, considers her to be an angel. Um, and because she said that, she pretty much disappeared after that. She said she put her head back down, she put her head up, and the lady was gone. And she expected her to be midway through the hallway. And only God knows, you know, whether she was an angel or just an old lady in the right place at the right time. But my mom had the courage then to go into the waiting room and get her stuff. And she was really preparing to leave. Then the doctor called her name. And she went into his office, and he hadn't cleaned up the blood from the last abortion and there was blood on the floor. So she gasped and took a step back and said, no, you know, I, I want to have this baby, like I changed my mind. And he said no, and uh, tried to kind of calm her down, like let's just, let's just go with this. And uh, she said no, and he raised his voice, he yelled at her and said, don't leave this room. And my mother, who at the time, didn't understand the dynamics of abortion, didn't understand the industry, really didn't know much of anything about the way those things worked. She still sensed that it was about money, that it was about profit, that he did not want her leaving that room because there goes his business for the day. And maybe if she walks past the girls that are in the waiting room and they see somebody else walking out, maybe there goes the other clients that he has. <laughs> you know, my friend, I have a friend, Abby Johnson, and she, was a manager of a Planned Parenthood in Texas, and she ended up coming out of it. She wrote a book called Unplanned. And she told me how her particular clinic had abortion quotas, that there was a line in their budget, a certain amount of money that they had to bring in in order for their business to run. And so my mom sensed that, but thankfully she didn't let that stop her. And she ended up uh, running out, calling my dad on the payphone, and she told him to come pick her up, and he picked her up. It's about the countless children who have no voice. And not just the children that have no voice, the women who are being taken advantage of by an industry that manipulates them. You can get an abortion at 13 years old, 14 years old, without even notifying your parents. You can't even take a bus home without even telling your parents that you're going on a different bus. You can't even go to the school nurse without telling your parents that you're getting an aspirin. 
But the state of Connecticut has said that it is in the best interest of a minor to be able to have an abortion, a surgical or medical procedure, without even notifying her parents. You know, there was a, a former abortion worker, her name is Carol Ebert, and she wrote a book called Blood Money. And she talked about how when she worked for the abortion industry, she would come into schools and she would talk to high school students. And what she would do, the first thing she would do is try to separate them from their parents. She would say things like, hey, do your parents talk to you about sex? And of course, a lot of times their parents did it. And they'd be like, I, I always talk to my kids about sex. You would always come talk to me. And she had this process where she would get them hooked on low dosage birth control because she knew they're 15 years old, they're not going to take their birth control, and where are they going to go when their birth control fails? They're going to come back to me for an abortion. And so she talked about this later in her book, how she had all of these steps, separate them from their parents, gain their trust, put them in low dosage birth control, wait for them to come back when it fails and to get an abortion, and of course charge them for that. In the same way, that's what our state government does when it says, you can't go talk to your parents about this. You don't need to go talk to your parents about this. We understand you. You can do it on your face for abortions in Connecticut. The state website says as long as they're medically necessary. You know, I saw that and I thought, medically necessary? I wonder if that's even true. Like, I wonder if doctors are, what's medically necessary in the eyes of a doctor? Is it that I'm having an emotional time? Is that I'm feeling anxiety? Like, what is that? Because, they said it doesn't have to be that the woman's life is in danger. Now, again, compared to other states, there's a lot of states that have mandatory ultrasound. So if you are going to get an abortion, you have to have an ultrasound. Not to trick you, like some people say, not to make you feel bad, but to let you see it. Because guess what? If you have an abortion and you've not had an ultrasound and you've just listened to someone tell you it's a clump of tissue, it's a clump of cells, then five years later you have a wanted baby and you are in the doctor's office, and now you're having an ultrasound, and you're so happy, and you're with your partner, and you're looking at the screen, and you're like, what? That's what the baby looks like at 12 weeks? That's a real thing. That's a real thing for women, because, wait a minute, nobody told me that's what the baby looked like. So now you're, I'm supposed to be so happy with my baby, and it's like, that's what I aborted? So these laws, mandatory ultrasounds, 24-hour waiting period, so it's not your boyfriend dragging you into the abortion clinic, or your parent, and I've seen this. I've stood outside abortion clinics and literally seen parents, boyfriends, dragging girls in. Christina, she was like, all you do is go in, and they're like, okay, you want an abortion? Good. And she's like, and they kind of pressure you. She was like, you know, a couple times I wasn't sure, and they're like, no, no, you want an abortion. And I'm like, wait a minute. So you're telling me they asked you no questions. It didn't have to be medically necessary. They just gave you an abortion? And she was like, yes. And I was like, those jerks. There's a website you can go on called Check My Clinic, and unfortunately it has no information on Connecticut because again, Connecticut's only reporting every four years, so you can't find information on Connecticut. Is it that there's no botched abortions happening? No, because I know girls that have botched abortions in these clinics. Is it that there's no issues with you know equipment not being sterilized or women you know women leaving on stretchers? All these things are happening. A woman left on a stretcher from a Harvard UI abortion. Clinic. So as you can see. Why is abortion a civil rights issue? Why is it a human rights issue? Because it's dehumanizing children, and women, and also men, are being violated. They're being abused, they're being pressured, they're being manipulated, they're being taken advantage of by a system that's bigger than, than they can even understand. We might think, well, the idea that a woman owns her child, that's my body, my choice, that that's property, that I own this child inside of me, is false, it's wrong, it's a lie. DNA, blood, two hearts, the woman's heart, the baby's heart, beating at the same time. This is a separate, unique human being that does not deserve to be dismembered for convenience or for personal gain. Now, do we need to fix things in society? Absolutely doing it at the same time because maternity homes are popping up and pregnancy resource centers are popping up and you know people are fighting against uh, pregnancy discrimination and they're you know fighting for women to be able to keep their jobs when they're pregnant etc etc so many of us are doing this at the same time but there's so much history when it comes to this issue and the more you dig into the history the more you see the deception so you may or may not know this, but even the Roe and Roe v. Wade, Norma McCorvey, and the Doe and Doe v. Bolton, Sandra Kano, both of those women were not 
just trying to get an abortion. Those women were manipulated by lawyers and people with an agenda. And I, I've watched in person Sandra Kano, and if you don't know what Dole Lee Bolton is, that's a sister case for Roe v. Wade, which made abortion legal up to nine months. She said, I didn't even know I was that dope. This is what she said when I was in Georgia. I didn't even know that was my case until later because I was so far removed from it. The simple sense, what it means is that you're fighting for the dignity and the rights of women. And I began looking at abortion and how it exploits those rights. You think about gender side, for example. Um, you've got all these, you know, these countries in India and, um, and in China where children are being killed just because they're girls. Just because they're girls, they're being aborted or they're being put in orphanages. And not only that, but they have such things as, as the family planning police, where the family planning police are going into the homes of, you know, of women and men, and they're making them have these abortions. And I thought, you know, if I look at the feminist movement in general, they're so, they don't, you know, by and large, they're pro-choice, even though the history is different. So because they don't want to talk about abortion, they're never going to talk about this part of it even though they would agree for the most part. Like, even a pro-choice feminist would say, I don't think that a woman should be forced to have an abortion, and I don't think that a, a baby should be aborted just because she's a girl. They would say that if you ask them that, but they're not going to talk about it, because to talk about it means you have to look at the reality of our views. So society beforehand, uh, let's say like maybe 50, 60 years ago, when a woman got pregnant, they put the pressure on the man. The pressure was on the man to be responsible for that. You have to marry her. Now, is it right for a woman to always get married to a guy that gets her pregnant? No, of course not, you know? But still, there was this pressure on the man. Now, years later, the pressure is on the woman. It's her responsibility. Now, of course, society makes you think that's a good thing, because it's like, my body, my choice, it's my right. But really, it's allowed men to completely wipe their hands of this issue and say, and, and not only wipe their hands, but they get like, cheered and applause for doing it. Like, all I have to say is like, girl, it's your body, your choice, like you do your thing, I support you, whatever. I'm gonna go play video games, or, or you know, whatever it is. And like, really, like, society says like, that's exactly what a man should do. Really, when a woman is like totally afraid and like in a crisis situation and doesn't know what to do, the thing that a man should do is like, whatever you wanna do, girl. Like, because the reality is that the majority of the time when a man says, we're gonna get through this together, I'm here for you. I'm not leaving you. Like, very often a woman will say, okay, let's do this. I've seen it happen over and over and over again with real women that I've worked with. And so I began to realize that this is really oppression. Like, this is not, uh, this, this issue is not aiding women. How can we also make society a better place for a woman to feel like she can have a pregnancy? Which is what feminism is about, making it society a safer, better place for women. So if you're pregnant on campus, what does that look like for you? You know, what, is there a place that you can breastfeed? You know, is there a place that you can do that without people looking at you, you know? If you're pregnant on campus, are there any dorms that you can keep your baby in and be pregnant? You know, most likely no, why? Because the whole system is set up so that you, if you don't have a baby, like, and if you have a baby, like you drop out of school, it's, it's hard. I'm not saying that moms don't stay, but they have to really, you know, they have to struggle. But now having these conversations about how, you know, being a pro-life feminist, or even if you don't identify like that, being pro-woman, pro-life, we can start talking about like, no, let's let's make a diaper changing place in a bathroom. Why is there not like, you know, an ability for a woman to go into a college bathroom and, and just change a baby's diaper? You know, why isn't there a place where a girl can nurse without having to go into the toilet and close the door? Wouldn't that make it easier if you were pregnant on campus and you looked over and you saw that resource? Um, if anybody has an abortion or they want to have an abortion, like uh, contact our school health department because we'll send you a, like a post-abortion kit. Like we'll send you a kit of like tea and chocolate and like everything else. And like our students, like the students in this pro life group, wrote back and they're like, "And what are you going to do for keeping their baby? Like, um, what what are the resources?" And they, and one of my friends, Joy, she went to the uh, person who sent the email out and was like, this is unfair. Like, a girl's gonna read this and think that you're helping her in one way, but you're not gonna help her in the other way.